Hi everyone and welcome to Ask the Horse Live. I'm your host Michelle Anderson, Digital Managing Editor of The Horse. Tonight we're talking about protecting horse farms from fire. Last year a video went viral that showed grooms and staff trying to evacuate horses from San Luis Ray Downs in California as wildfire tore through the barns. Uh, the images were terrifying. Uh, they showed horses galloping uh, people doing their best to get the animals out of barns and into trailers. And it was a stark reminder of how dangerous fire is. In the end, 46 horses died and humans sustained burn injuries and respiratory damage from smoke inhalation. And that was just one incident in many involving uh, wildfires in 2017. Here in central Oregon, where I live, we had a blanket of smoke from the Northern Californian fires and the Eagle Creek fire that was along the Columbia River Gorge that settled in on us for most of late summer and most of fall. In addition to wildfire, at the horse we frequently are covering devastating barn fires often started by hay combustion, faulty wiring, or box fans and stalls. All these incidences continue to remind us how vulnerable we and our horses are to the power of fire. So how do we protect our horses and the humans that are in our barns and on our horse farms? Tonight, we are joined by two experts to help answer that question. We have Elaine Blickley of um, Horses for Clean Water, who teaches about managing horses on small properties, and Rebecca Jimenez, who is a co-founder and instructor for Technical Large Animal Emergency Rescue, which trains first responders and horse owners about how to deal with natural disasters and emergencies. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you for having Thank us. You for having us. Uh, let's start with you, Elaine. Can you tell us a little bit about your interest in creating FireWise horse properties? Yes, sure. So I work on uh, horse keeping and land management issues uh, for horse owners and horses. So I teach about things like mud management and pasture management, as well as wildlife enhancement, and also about conserving natural resources. So FireWise education was a natural extension of that because it's all part of the land management um, scenario, as well as protecting natural resources. And you know, when we started looking at plants and things to uh, that would be habitat for animals or that we wanted for landscaping. We wanted to make sure that we weren't uh, using plants and materials that would be uh, fire prone and fuel for fires. So a few years back, I got funding to help develop uh, a body of material um, on FireWise, and that was funded by the Bureau of Land Management. And Rebecca, can you tell us about your experience with wildfires um, and barn fire prevention and response? Sure. Um, first of all, I'm a Georgia firefighter, and I also teach firefighters and veterinarians and uh, provide outreach to horse people um, really all around the world. I try to do some things on the internet as well as in person, and uh, most of my passion is trying to get people the truth about fires. I never knew the truth about fires and how it actually can affect a facility. I was always told the same myth that everybody else gets. And uh, now I'm on the technical committee for the National Fire Protection Association. They have a standard 150 that you guys can actually look it up under NFPA 150. And I am the person that makes recommendations to the standard, particularly for the equine um, interests. There's a bunch of people on that from the dogs, the poultry, the swine, the uh, veterinarians, the uh, boarding facilities for dogs and cats and all those things, but I try to help with the equine portion. And that basically tells the firefighters across the country and around the world how we're supposed to be providing life safety and fire safety to animals. So trying to, to uh, educate people as we move forward. Okay. And I'm going to uh, point out to everyone that you are Dr. Rebecca Jimenez, but tonight you have said that I can call you Rebecca. So uh, we have Thank Rebecca you. and Elaine with us. <laughs> I appreciate that. It makes it easier on my end uh, with two experts. <laughs> Before we dive in, I want to give all of our live listeners a quick review of our Ask the Horse Live format. Uh, we're going to start with the questions that everyone submitted during registration, but if you're listening, 
live uh, via your computer, you can send in questions via your browser. Uh, feel free to ask questions, clarification. If there's anything that our experts share that you'd like to know more about, go ahead and, and send us a message and we'll be reading those live. We're gonna do our best to get to as many of your questions as possible uh, on this important topic. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, Rebecca, the first question's for you and it's from Julie in San Antonio, Texas. And she what are the most common causes of stable fires? Okay, well, NFPA has done a lot of research um, over the years, um, both in residential homes and in agricultural fires, and it's basically the same. It's electrical, number one, far and away. All the things that we put in our facilities, I often tease my female friends that they are trying to hide from the husband, and we take our uh, heaters, our fans, our, uh, these days it's uh, also an espresso machine, out to the, to the barn with us. But it's all of those electrical things, many of which draw a lot of the current, which might be your washers, your dryers, um, even put people put in infrared heaters, all those things. If your electrical system is not updated and your electrical is not um, the right size for the load that you're putting on it, you're just asking for, for trouble. And then, of course, there's smoking. Um, somebody's tossing an, ac an accidental butt. Lightning is the third. And sadly, Arson is still a cause of barn fires. Um, it's not a very common one, but sadly there are some crazy people who just do not um, like horses or they're mad at the ex-spouse. Um, um, for whatever reason, they're just crazy and they want to see something burn and they don't care that there's something living and breathing that's trapped in the barn. Um, really, these the, <laughs> the sad thing about barn fires is technically they're almost totally preventable. Um, the problem is we, that we don't understand how fire starts and we don't understand how it promulgates. And so we often um, get ourselves in some trouble with that lack of understanding. Yeah. So, Rebecca, I know that um, barns in, in different states have different um, laws, regulations on electrical inspections in agricultural buildings. Um, some states okay. require permitting, some don't uh, for electrical work. How important is it that people have a qualified electrician uh, do the electrical work in their barn and then have uh, an inspection to make sure that everything's done correctly? It's crucial, and I think that's where we get ourselves. I've been there. When I was younger, I bought a little barn uh, that happened to be on a piece of property I purchased, and I walked in, and I turned on the lights, and I was like, yay, the lights work. And that was the extent of my so-called electrical inspection. Um, but I didn't have anybody qualified to actually check it. And I didn't want to pay the extra that it would have cost a couple hundred dollars to have someone qualified to come out and inspect the system. Sadly, in many of, as you pointed out, agricultural states, um, states where agriculture doesn't have to be checked. Um, it's not up to the same code as you would have for an occupancy, uh, an occupancy being something like a grocery store or even um, a home, um, you don't have to do those things. And so technically you're grandfathered in. Your building, if you purchased it uh, 50 years ago, you don't actually have to update it in many states. And that's the problem. When you purchase that property, especially for a used barn used, uh, that was previously built, you are at the mercy of whatever someone chose to do previous to you purchasing the property. I really can't stress enough getting an updated electrical evaluation by a qualified electrician for your new place and telling them the truth about what you're planning to put in the barn. I'm going to put a washer and dryer. I'm going to put a 50-gallon water heater. I'm going to put a tankless heater. Whatever you're going to do, put it in that barn. Um, give them a good idea of what the real electrical load in that building is going to be because otherwise the electrician occur, uh, assumes that your loading is going to be pretty simple. A couple of fans and a couple of lights. That's what they would assume. Okay. Um, our next question is for Elaine, and that's from Karen in Lafayette, California. And Karen wants to know where the best place is to store hay to minimize fire danger. If you store it in the barn, does it help to keep the hay covered? Well, you definitely want to keep the hay as far away as possible from where your horses are. Not only does that minimize your fire risk or the 
potential fuel for a fire, but it also is going to minimize dust and mold for respiratory issues for horses as well as people. So if you have a separate hay barn that has a fire break between it and the barn, that would be great. So that would be like um, an area with uh, without vegetation, so like a gravel road um, in between or a green lawn or something that's not going to carry, that's not going to be fuel to carry a fire from the hay barn to your barn where the animals are. And as far as covering it, it might help if you had sparks, if you're in an area where there were sparks, there was a fire and there were embers that were blowing in. But um, any little pile of hay that's uh, showing at all is going to be a fuel source for fire. I don't know, Rebecca, if you have any other thoughts about covering it. I think you are right on it. It, it. The problem with those wildfires is the little, the little brands, the fire brands that drop from fires that may be even miles away. They're just looking for something to catch, and uh, that's very, very difficult to do. Uh, uh, they often tell you you're supposed to close up the barn. Uh, I have some friends in California that actually bought those big 40-foot containers and put their hay inside the container because they can actually lock it up where there's nothing that can get into it. It's um, wow. very frustrating to try to prevent those little firebrands from getting into something that's combustible. Now, Rebecca, if the um, if you cover hay, is there any risk for spontaneous combustion? If it, if you're using it, covering, there's, there's a coverage? lot of research. There's a yeah, there's a lot of research that goes into that, and I'm not the expert on that. But the things that I have read tell me that it has to do with the microbial digestion um, of hay. And of course, when hay is cured, it reaches a particular temperature, hopefully in the field. But if you bring it in too soon, it's green, it's got too much moisture content, then the bacterial action in that hay will cause that temperature to get very high. And it can get to a temperature where it can actually ignite under certain conditions. Um, that is that is part of the science and, and art that goes into making hay. And that's why I tell people, find a good hay person that will give you hay that has already been um, allowed to set in the field. And yeah, it is and they've had the moisture. A, yeah, that's, that's moisture really, tested. You know, they've got all these moisture content meters and things like that that you're supposed to use. I see so many people that just get hay from the guy down the street that has no expertise and they start so many fires. Yeah. Well, and I'll say, like, my hay guy does do moisture testing on his hay, and every once in a while, I'll still get a slug bale that just was a little <laughs> moist, and um, yeah. and he's he's always very uh, apologetic about that because he really tries, but <laughs> but even you know even with the best hay producer, right, that can happen. Yep. So. Um, our next question is for Elaine. It's from Rebecca in Metal, Medical Lake, Washington. She said that she has trees everywhere on her property. I, I'm thinking up in Medical Lake, it's probably pine trees that she has. Um, she wants to know what's the best solution uh, that you would recommend for keeping the barn safe with all those trees? Yeah, and I don't know if Medical Lake is Eastern or Western Washington, but either way, especially if it's Eastern Washington, east of the I, I Cascade. I think it's near Spokane, but I could be wrong. Yeah. But that's where I think it is. Um, so for all buildings that you want to protect, you're supposed to implement what's called defensible space. And that's 100 feet out. It's uh, And it's concentric rings. So the first ring is 30 feet out from the barn or the house. The second ring is 30 feet beyond that. And then the last ring is 40 feet. And so in that first 30 feet, you want to, you don't want any trees. You want everything to be lean and green and low. Um, so that it's mostly like lawn and uh, rock and hardscaping. And you can have some kinds of plants like succulents and low growing types of plants. Then in the next 30 feet, in the next concentric ring, then trees there you can limb up 
from the ground like six feet. You don't want any trees to touch each other so that if you did get a crown fire that it wouldn't pass from one tree to another. So you're gonna to have to thin them so that they don't touch each other. Um, and you definitely don't wanna have trees uh, that are going to touch uh, the side of a building or a roof because that can just pull fire from the ground up to the tree and then on to the house and even when you have like a metal building the uh, usually at the top the soffit um, around the top there's you know still usually a wooden structure and so uh, a tree going up can just pull the fire up up to those wooden areas and they can burn Our next question is for Rebecca. It's from Virginia and Georgia, and she said wants to know: in a barn fire, is turning all the horses loose within a fenced area the right thing to do until you can separate them from each other? Okay, um, that's a good question, and there's a few caveats to that. First of all, just like Elaine was saying, anything that's going to possibly burn, such as your fence, um, if it's too close to the barn that's burning, it could theoretically burn. And I'm aware of several cases where that has happened. They got the horses out, they put them into a fence, the fence burned, the horses got loose and either ran down the down the aisleway towards the road or they ran back into the burning barn. And in one case in Kentucky, they lost 13 horses that had already been brought out of the barn in the first case. And so yes, that's a good idea. That's what you should do as long as it's at least 50 feet away. Um, it's pretty amazing how far radiant heat can go and actually cause even a wooden fence or a metal uh, fence to, to either burn or to uh, melt, uh, to, to bend and, and break. And then of course, the other thing is uh, we would call that a run out plan um, that takes a little bit of a setup as far as fencing, how you're gonna do that, where you can open stall doors, chase the horse out to the pasture, um, or you're faced with catching each horse individually and putting them in that paddock that you wish to put them in. And of course you put them in and then you gotta close the gate. And then when you bring the next horse, you've gotta drive the other horses out of the way and close the gate again, or else they will go back in the barn. Um, I just tell people, you don't even have to have firefighters there. You don't have to have all the insanity of an actual fire to practice that. Take two of your boarders and set a timer and have them run down the barn aisle, catch each horse one by one, run back down, put them in the paddock, close the gate and come back and just with two people try that and see how long it takes you to evacuate your barn. It'll scare you to death. Um, it's, it's longer uh, than unless you you're think. an Olympic runner. Yeah. Yeah. Unless you're an Olympic run, runner. I mean, <laughs> I don't know about you, but there's a, <laughs> with the excitement of the situation and trying to call 911 while you're running and you're trying to evacuate horses, People have done it in real life, and they just, they tell me, you know, I, I, I tried to get as many of my horses as I could out of this facility, and I can't believe that I only saved half my horses, um, yeah. because I was standing there when I saw the fire start. Yeah. I worked and at a ther therapeutic riding center, and we had to do drills for our accreditation, um, and even with those good old horses, we'd actually evacuate them off the property, um, and good good old horses that know how to get in the trailers to try to when everyone even just the pressure of a drill and knowing that the you're mm -hmm. going against the timer and trying to get those horses mm -hmm. in the trailer and off the property took us much longer than we had expected so Elaine, yeah, sorry, I, I, I always tell people it's very few people have ever been able to show me i often say put up or shut up and people try to show me and then they're just amazed and, and I'm, of course i'm very nice about it but i say you know, it's not your fault. It's human factors. It's horse factors. It's panic. It's a real situation. Um, there's, it's very difficult to do. Yeah, and what I was going to say, and uh, Rebecca and I chatted a little bit about this beforehand too, is that what you, a lot of times when I'm teaching my firewise classes, people say, well, if there's a wildfire, I'm just going to turn all my horses loose, and that is like the last thing you want to do um, is to turn them loose off of your property because horses are social creatures. They're, you know, more like our dogs and they come to us, you know, to humans for help and they don't know what to do and they're going to congregate in roads and go to other people. And then that's going to prevent emergency management 
people, personnel from being able to get into your property or wherever they need to go. And then even though your horse may not be on your property, you're, it's still your horse and you're liable for that horse if it causes an accident. So don't yep. turn your horses loose. It makes everything worse. Yeah. And there's so many horror stories, just like Elaine said, of, of fire trucks trying to get to those kinds of properties, driving through the smoke, hitting a horse. And of course, they feel awful about it. You're going to feel awful about it. But wouldn't you feel even worse if somebody got killed um, trying to evacuate from the fire and hit your horse? No. So um, you would be responsible for that. And that's, that's just awful. We have a question from our live audience. Uh, John would like to know what type of fire extinguisher is recommended and what size for a 628 horse barnmaster barn. Uh, so the barn <laughs> masters are, are the modular barns. Um, or do you yeah. have any other general comments about how big or how many fire extinguishers you need per number of horses? Rebecca? Um, I'll, I'll take that one. So what I tell people, and this is going to go back to some of my other comments, is Get with your local fire department, have them come out and do a pre-plan of your facility. There's nothing like having your local fire department walk through your facility. First of all, they now know what the facility looks like. They can make some suggestions. There's no place that I'm aware of that's going to charge you a tax or bill you or give you a, um, a, a SID list of things that you've done, they're there to help you. I'm a member of my local fire department. We do this often for people. They will tell you what you need, but I, I will scare you that I walk in many barns and people have the cheap five pound fire extinguishers that you can buy at Lowe's or Walmart or wherever. And those things have less than nine seconds worth of stuff in them. And we have taken hay bales out in the parking lot with boys, kids and pony club kids. Um, and we light up the bale in the parking lot and we give them a five pound fire extinguisher. And after the bale's burning really good and the strings have burned off and it's opened up a little bit, we give them the fire extinguisher and say, hey, go put that out. And they'll go blow the whole nine seconds worth of chemical onto the fire. And then we'll sit there. It looks like it's out. And then it's slowly smoldering. And then the wind picks up and 30 seconds later or a minute later, it's starting to, to burn again. So we hand another five pound extinguisher to a kid and they try to put it out again and it looks like it's covered with white stuff it looks like it's out and, and again the wind starts to pick up five or ten minutes later while you're sitting there thinking oh it's out and, and you you think you're done it catches again so a 10 pound fire extinguisher is my recommendation if you're talking about a big barn with 40 people 40 horses in it you really need to consider investing in some of the industrial um, rolling uh, fire extinguishers and you need to get some training because it's pretty amazing how many people in the civilian world have never actually fired a fire extinguisher and it actually takes some training if you do it wrong you'll be wasting most of the chemical that's in that fire extinguisher and an ABC fire extinguisher is very good for barns but also you may consider investing in some of the water fire extinguishers to be able to wet that um, that material and those are pretty cool because those can be refilled uh, much cheaper than refilling some of your um, heavy duty ABC chemical fire extinguishers. So you mentioned the, the flare backup after it's extinguished and then yes, ma'am. That's right. So uh, there was some interesting reporting about our Eagle Creek wildfire that happened last fall here in Oregon. Warren. Um, it was pretty devastating. It got contained out all winter long, you know, snow, rain in Oregon all, all winter long, and they're having flare ups from that fire um, again, which is wow. just fascinating. Yeah, you guys have the really? kind of stuff wow. that's pretty impressive. It'll actually work down into the roots and, mm -hmm. and just tamp it down. It's pretty amazing. Scary. Yeah, yeah. Fire, fire, fire is powerful, so which is why it's good that we're talking about it. Uh, tonight. So uh, Rebecca, our next question is for you. It's from Rita in Ohio. And she said that uh, one of her boarder really wants to leave a fan on at night for her horse. Uh, and she says that it's not safe and that no one, or when no one's in proximity to watch that fan. And so I do want to note also, we got a lot of questions about fans and <laughs> fans come up 
because horses get hot for one, and then also horses have insect sensitivity. The uh, a fan can help keep biting mosquitoes and gnats off the horses. So, um, what do you have to say about fans and barns? Okay, this is my chance to say that the people that build barns are usually horse people telling horse people how to build a barn. And horse people never ask a ventilation engineer, a structural engineer, a veterinarian, or a firefighter how to build a barn. Um, if you look in most of those books that, about how to build a barn, you will never see them address fire safety. You'll never see them address ventilation. Honestly, if you talk to those, the ventilation, the structural engineer, the firefighter and the veterinarian, you would come up with a very different looking barn. But as horse people, we like the traditional look of a barn. Um, and it turns out that that's about 600 years old. We need to update the design, uh, sadly. Um, it really comes down to lack of ventilation. Why do we have to have those fans in those stalls? Because we have such crappy ventilation in barns in the first place. And that's sort of pretty obvious when you say it that way, but we never think about that. Say, oh, each stall has to have its own individual ventilation. If you did it right, you'd have excellent ventilation throughout the entire facility. And horses are not naked, so they don't need the kind of ventilation that we need. They need a different kind of ventilation. Anyway, um, all that to say, they're sort of both right, okay? Rita's right and her border is right. They're thinking ventilation and they're thinking safety, so good for them. The problem is, what you really need to understand is, there's no way if you're standing in the barn and you watch a spark hit down into your hay, you, even if you're standing there, you will be doing very well to get all your horses out if you're standing there and you have a plan and you've practiced it before because you technically have less than three to five minutes from ignition of a fire to get animals out and kids out and people out and the farrier and the veterinarians and the trainers and everybody else that's in that barn three to five minutes. And meanwhile, you're going to be trying to call 911 to get the fire department there. You're going to be trying to evacuate horses, all those things. Being in close proximity really, to me, is a myth. It doesn't matter if somebody's standing there. I've got several hundred horse barn fires in my database. And I've got several where three to five to six people were standing in the barn when the fire started. They saw it hit the cobwebs, they saw the spark fall into the hay, and they did not get all the horses out. In some cases, they didn't get any of the horses out. They didn't have a plan, they panicked, they ran around like chickens with their head cut off, they opened every stall door, there was a barn in Georgia, they opened every single stall door, 36 horses, not a single horse left, they didn't, and the horse, the, the facility was lost, they lost every single horse. Six people on a Tuesday afternoon, standing there on a sunny day, and they did not save a single horse. That, that's how fast it moves. People don't realize, they think that they're going to be able to make an effort to move those horses. You will not have time. And that's why the stall doors to the outside wall are so important. But people don't do it because it adds an extra expense to your barns. If you have to add that second door, and people say, oh, well, I've got that snow, I've got this, and I've got But if you've got that second stall door to the outside wall, it makes a lot of sense to be able to get your horses out from the outside wall. At least it's safer than running up and down the inside aisle where you can be exposed to the heat, the smoke, and possibly the building collapse on top of your head. Okay. Sorry. So, I know. It's depressing. <laughs> well, I, I, I sound like I'm being depressing. This is more depressing than talking about euthanasia of horses. <laughs> well, so you mentioned barns being designed in a way that's archaic, basically. And... Um, are there some options that we have? Like, does it make sense to put uh, commercial sprinkler systems in a barn? Is that practical? Could it save lives? It does. Uh, the problem is, okay, let me address the fans first. Okay. UL 507 compliant fans or closed housing fans. They're usually at least 100 bucks. They may be more than that for that same fan for the individual stall instead of the $10 ones from Walmart, the cheapo box fans. You gotta have something where when you look at the back of the fan, you can't see the motor parts of the fan or it'll be stamped UL 507 compliant. Um, so sprinklers. Sprinklers are an option in certain climates, in certain areas. If you live in a state where you have 
problems accessing sufficient water. That's not going to work for you. Climate challenges with the cold, um, where you have a chance of, of it being too cold. Um, yes, there's some things can be filled with air. What I tell people is, instead of assuming you can't do it, why don't you just call a contractor and have them come out and do a quote? Cost you nothing, and you may look at that quote and say, mm, I can't afford that. Um, for, for a barn here in, in Georgia, I had a quote done um, for my area in Georgia, and it was $3,600 added on to the price of a four-stall, typical barn. Four stalls, and then you know, your little tack room, your little feed room, your little um, area to wash your horse, that kind of stuff. And $3,600 sounds like a pretty, that's pretty acceptable. The problem is when you start looking at where am I going to get my water, how am I going to make sure that it doesn't freeze, that does add to the expense. Um, I'm not saying it's impossible. Many places have done it. Many racetracks have a system in for their barns because they've had so many fires in the past um, where the fire department has to show up and they can sprinkle the entire barn. So it's not an automatic sprinkler system. It's one that uh, requires the fire department to get there. The problem is the time. And that, I think that is the fundamental challenge for most people understanding about barn fires your local fire department does the best they can but they have to get the 911 call then the 911 call has to tone out the fire department most fire departments if they're volunteer rural fire departments are going to have a lag time of how long it takes them to get in the truck get to the fire station get the fire truck and drive to your location in my community, it's 12 minutes. That's average call-out time for my volunteer fire department, and I'm on it. Um, in a city fire department where we don't have too many barns, <laughs> they often are paid staff, and people are sitting in the, in the fire truck or they're sitting in the fire department, and they will have a shorter call-out time. But you don't see that where we normally have horse barns. And that's the sad truth. We have to understand that the fire department is going to be there um, with their lag time for the 911 call and and getting there, and that every minute you're losing um, time, and fire doubles or depending on who you talk to quadruples in every minute. And if that's true, then it is basically going to be out of control, nothing to salvage in no breathable space, um, nothing salvageable within three to five minutes in a small barn, and maybe you'll have seven to 12 minutes in a very large barn. Wow. Okay, our next question's for Elaine. Uh, Lila in Utah wants to know, what do you do if you're using Firewise practices on your property, but your neighbors aren't complying? Yeah, that's, that's a really tough one. Um, I would say to make them muffins and uh, go over and talk to them and then invite them to listen to this webinar with you. <laughs> um, there's not much you can do as far as uh, enforcement because there aren't really laws um, in most places. Sometimes there might may be laws or covenants within individual areas that require people to keep um, weeds, dried weeds mowed down and cleaned up along fences and buildings. But it's going to have to be more about being a, a good neighbor and um, trying to get along with your neighbors and uh, talking to them in the, the friendliest, most positive, constructive manner possible. Mm -hmm. yeah. In our area, um, there are some um, local laws about noxious weeds and it's our noxious weeds that grow up and then we're in the desert so they grow and then they dry out and then they are incredibly uh, combustible um, and so it's challenging especially on small properties like I have uh, when neighbors especially people new to the area move in and they don't they don't understand what those weeds are going to look like in the summer um, and getting ahead of them. Um, do you have any recommendations, Elaine, for controlling weeds like that for people who don't want to use herbicides? Because that's a challenge. Like get 
new neighbors and they have weeds that are out of control mm -hmm. and then that's you know can be some pushback um i know i don't like to use herbicides we ended up we had to like after years of fighting it we finally uh, ended up using herbicides but do you have any recommend recommendations right that don't right. include herbicides yeah what i would say is mow better mm -hmm. <laughs> you gotta just mow 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 and uh try to keep a try to keep ahead of them and um, get a handle on it early on. You can use goats or other livestock also for weed control. Like um, in a lot wow. of areas, they will use goats commercially um, and stake them up, stake them out on hillsides to mow back uh, weeds and, and dried weeds and plants. Um, and then again, don't let the dried weeds collect along fence lines and along buildings. That's a really important one too. So just try to keep ahead of it. Um, Rebecca, our next question is for you. It's from Kimberly in Tennessee. And she wants to know if you recommend having lightning rods on your barn, do they endanger the horses that are standing in them or do they help? If they are put in correctly, there is no problem with those lightning rods, and it only makes sense that a large steel structure is going to attract lightning. Um, so you might as well have a way to channel the bolt. And there's been a lot of research that's been put into that over many, many years, and it is commonly used. The problem is if you don't maintain the system. Um, they're absolutely not dangerous to humans in any way, shape, or form as long as they've been maintained. In other words, all the connections are there. If you have a problem with the connection or there's a, um, the connector is not tight, then you, you can actually end up building, burning your barn down from lightning. Um, now, is a lightning rod going to save your barn from a direct hit of lightning? It, there's no research to say that absolutely is 100% protective. However, it may be able to assist, and they're usually relatively inexpensive to put on your facility. To me, um, I would call, call that cheap insurance. Um, our next question is from our live audience, and uh, it's a follow-up question. Uh, Rebecca, I'm going to shoot it over to you. It has to do back with when we were talking about turning horses out together and out of their stalls during a fire. Uh, Stephanie is listening and she wants to know if it's okay to turn horses loose in pastures if they're connected to the barn. Also, and this is a, a second question, it's should you be concerned about electric fences being a source of fire? Okay, Don't, normally those electric fences, if it's gonna get hit by lightning, I've actually been unlucky enough to see a horse fence um, hit by lightning, it will normally short it out because it just whacks it and it's such a large voltage. Um, so you don't really have to worry about that so much. Um, turning horses out that are attached to the barn, I really would prefer that you have a gate system that, yes, it would be nice if you could chase them out and they go into the pasture and you um, use a cattle paddle or something to drive them away, and then you have another gate further away from the barn that you can close again to keep them a long way away. Once the horses are out of the barn and in a pasture, then they're gonna fart and run and buck and probably bite the snot out of each other and all the things that horses do, and who cares? Because now you've got time, once the horses are out, you don't have to be worried about the life safety hazard. You can make sure that you know, you've know you done the due diligence of calling the fire department when they get there. Uh, you can make sure that they are able to focus on the fire and not have to worry about the life safety hazard. And of course, we keep talking about horses. Really, don't forget, just like she was talking about the um, the path facility, you got to get the kids and you got to get the people out first. That's your real first um, priority. Then your animals. And then, you know, if you had the time, if you were able to knock the fire out, then you can save some of your other things that may be in that facility. Um, but it is, it, no saddle is worth your life. No. <laughs> No inanimate object. It's, it's, that's what insurance is for. Insure your facility. Um, make sure you've covered all of your stuff. You know, all the things they always tell you to do. Walk around once a year with a video camera and get videotape of everything you've got in the facility as far as 
anything valuable and how you've built the facility, document it and get a copy of that and put it in your bank safe so that you know you've got a copy of it. That's what insurance is for. Yeah, so that's an inventory, basically, a visual inventory of, of what you have. So if it does all burn, yes, you can remember, oh, yeah, I, I forgot about that extra saddle for that. Other horse. <laughs> exactly. I don't know if you guys have any of those laying around, but I have a couple. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, our next question um, is for Elaine, and then I, I think Rebecca will have um, some to add to it, too, because we were discussing this earlier before our live event. Uh, Gail's in New York, and she wants to know if you can build a fireproof barn, what are the best practices? And then we have Beth in Texas who wants to know how fireproof are cinder block stalls. So we have two kind of related um, questions there. Elaine, what recommendations or what do you see as you're doing farm tours that people are doing to have non-combustible barns? Yeah, I can um, have some comments and then uh, Rebecca, I'm sure, will have a lot more as well to add to it. So first of all, what you want to think about is to choose a location. If you're building, choose a location that's not at the top of a hill or a draw because those being at the top of a hill, um, it just acts like a chimney. The landscape acts like a chimney. And if there's a fire at the bottom, it's just going to pull it right up the wicket, right up the side of the hill to the building that's at the top. And then for your material choices, you want to use metal or non-flammable materials, especially for the roof. And also the same for fencing. So for fencing, you want to think about like wire or pipe or panel fencing as much as possible, especially if you're in a fire-prone area, like in some of the irrigated areas out west. Um, you also want to have your hay in a separate building that's away from everything else. And also, if you use shavings or anything else that could be fuel for fire, store that away from your barn and your horses. Um, also have fire breaks, like we mentioned before, which can be like driveways. It could even be plowed up areas. It could be irrigation ditches. It could be creeks or ponds or pools or sidewalks or it could be lawn, irrigated lawn, uh, anything like that is a fire break and have those between your hay storage as well as between buildings so that if you did have a fire in one place it would stop it from being elsewhere. And then be sure to implement the defensible space landscaping that I touched on earlier. And I have um, an article on on all of that too with the horse that uh, people can reference. Yeah, and for anyone Absolutely. who's listening, listening live, uh, Jennifer, our producer, will put that link up uh, for that article. Rebecca? I was going to say, you know, the irony of this is I actually met Elaine when we were over in Australia. I didn't meet her in the United States. And <laughs> um, I think she probably had the same reaction that I did. The Australians take fire safety are far more seriously than we do. Their fires, uh, their trees are twice as tall. They actually drop the dust. Uh, those eucalyptus trees try to burn, and uh, the entire landscape is made to burn. It's um, absolutely amazing. But because of that, the Australians understand how dangerous these wildfires are, and they do back burns. They take it, the, the whole fire-wise concept, to the nth degree in many areas because they've watched it happen year after year after year. Um, but I totally echo everything that Elaine's saying, and you know nothing truly is fireproof, but you do the best that you can to limit the amount of combustibles, absolutely no flammables in the barn. I, I don't see any reason to have flammables in the barn, even if you've got things like diesel fuels and gasoline for your tractors and stuff. What's really supposed to happen is those are supposed to be in a separate tractor shed, and there's yellow cabinets that they use at the chemical comp companies and and um, at the auto companies, it's for the same reason. You put those flammables inside a flammable cabinet so that there's no way that they can catch anything on fire. Um, uh, you know, it seems a little crazy to take it to that degree. But when you go to Australia and you see how they do it, it's, uh, <laughs> it's a sobering thing because they have it far more often than we do. So, Rebecca, I'm actually planning on building my barn this fall. We're 
uh, in the planning stages for it. And uh, my tractor, I really want it under cover. Can I really not put it in my barn? <laughs> so, I mean, it is. Okay, like, so you can, but what you're going to do is you're going to put in a firewall between the side where the tractor is and where your horses are. And okay. uh, those firewalls are usually rated and to, you know, is it an hour long, two hour long, four hour long? And that could be a concrete block. It could be um, uh, the gypsum uh, board that, that's rated for, for an hour. Um, there are ways around that. And I totally understand. In, in Georgia, the reason that people always have everything in the same barn is because we pay taxes paid based on square footage. That may be true for many other areas. And so people don't want to have those separate facilities because it means that you're going to have to pay more for square footage. Why not have one square footage, shove everything in there? But of course, anytime you're putting things like uh, tractors, um, diesel fuel, those kind of things in the same space with your horses, you're just increasing the possibility of something that could go wrong. Yeah. Yeah, I so, promised my, I promised my husband we were moving the tractor out of his garage. So <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's what I was just going to say. I was going to say we store our tractor in our garage instead of our barn. Mm -hmm. Um and and instead of having a car in our garage, we have a tractor in it. <laughs> <laughs> it you have your priorities straight, Elaine. That's yeah, right. Sounds like they might be building another garage. <laughs> yeah. Well, right. I'm, I was thinking I'm pretty sure I paid more for my tractor than I did for, for my horses. So maybe the tractor will go in the barn and the horses will stay outside. <laughs> <laughs> But no, I'm joking. Maybe <laughs> it's, it's really all about you're you're not wrong. It's all really all about fuel loading. So what firefighters, what you look at as wood or tractors or hay, a firefighter calls that fuel loading. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> they really consider hay to be just as um, flammable as gasoline. So. Yeah. Um, just I tell people think about that if you think about it like a firefighter thinks about it it may change your your opinion of what you want to do yeah um Rebecca we have a follow-up question Diane is in the live audience and she missed the number uh, the UL compliance num code for the fans 507, that you mentioned UL 507 compliance and that's a closed housing fan um, and then Rebecca, we have another follow-up. Uh, Sally's in our live audience, and she says she has uh, stop fire extinguishers, uh, proper noun stop mm -hmm. fire, stop fire, with a Y, uh, and is wondering uh, where the best place is to put those. I'm not familiar with those. Can you explain what that is? I am. I am not familiar with those either. Are they the small, um, not halon, but they're the small ones that that fit above the stall? Yeah, I'm I'm not sure. So, um, Sally, if you're still listening, they've actually could... they've been doing some work with. Uh, I'll just uh, I'll assume something. It's probably okay. some of the work that they've been trying to do. There's some aloe based and some plant based um, fire extinguishers that they've been looking at, and I'm really excited about some of them because Jim Green and some of the folks over the UK have um, been experimenting with some of that, where you could have something similar to a quote automatic uh, sprinkler protection. And, and if any heat or smoke is detected above that stall with that horse in it, um, it would set this uh, basically sprinkler system off and it would fire off a, essentially a fire extinguisher into that stall and minimize the amount of fire. Now, the challenges for that are, of course, you already have to have fire, which implies the horse is exposed to the heat and the smoke already. And then, of course, you can imagine what the average horse in a stall is going to do when you have a fire extinguisher go off with them in it. Um, mm -hmm. However, if that preserves the rest of your barn, that may be an appropriate way to do it. So there's lots of things that we're trying to come up with that are non-toxic, um, won't scare the heck out of the horse, but also soak down the stall so that the fire doesn't promulgate. If that's what she's talking about, those are probably a really good thing. Unfortunately, not enough research has been done, particularly in horse stalls. Um, and if anybody wants to get together with me and I'd love to build a barn um, and burn it down with those kinds of things in it for research, I would love to do that. If I can find somebody else to do it. <laughs> so it looks like Sally followed up and she's saying that they are a high capacity extinguisher. So, um, oh, yeah. 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 
So that's good. Alan? Yeah. And so does that change your answer then? Is there? No, I, anything is high capacity. I, I love it. Okay. Um, Elaine, so you were talking about defen uh, defensible space around the barn. Uh, so uh -huh. lots of times, lots of times the prettiest barns have landscaping around them, right near the barn. Right. And they're yeah. beautiful. They're beautiful. Those are such pretty barns. Um, what recommendations do you have about having landscaping right around your barn or around the front entrance? Right. So I would say that you don't want to have any landscaping that's uh, any plants that are touching your barn, particularly if it's a wooden barn. Um, you want to have more hardscaping, so that's like rock mulch and rocks. And any kind of plants that you want to have, there are actually plants that you can get that are called fire wise or fire resistant. They usually have a high soap content or a high salt content, um, or they have a high moisture content, but they're going to be low in resin. Um, and they are going to be low and lean and green. And so you can use those um, in the first 30 feet around your barn. But there's definitely plants that are more flammable that you, that you want to avoid. Um, and you want to stick to the list of firewise plants. So I have another handout about firewise landscaping on horse properties or an article that um, people can access. But I also encourage people in their areas, particularly if you live in a fire prone area for wildfire, uh, so that's going to be primarily out west in the irrigated areas of the western states. You can contact natural resource agencies like conservation districts or extension um, or any of the state natural resource agencies. They should be able to help you and provide you with a list of firewise plants for your area. So I looked at a lot of photos after the fires in Northern California, the Santa Rosa area, and it was really interesting seeing the horses that had either been turned loose or got loose during all that chaos. Um, and a lot of them were standing right next to houses that had irrigated front lawns, you know, the lawns were green grass or asphalt. And so asphalt around the houses and um, there were the horses and there were several photos uh, of that. So I, I think that's that was really interesting to see the outcome, you know, what the horses actually did. Um, so I don't know, Rebecca, did you get to look at any of those photos? Oh, yes, I did. Absolutely. Yeah, I totally agree with yeah. what Elaine's saying. You know, you've, you've got to do that work ahead of time. You don't have time, um, particularly, I got a chance to go see the Santa Rosa thing, and, and the time that they had to be able to evacuate was extremely short. And, I mean, some of the stories are just horrific of people literally um, having somebody knock on the door and saying, put the kids, put the dogs in the car, and you got to go right now. you got less than 15 minutes. Um, yeah, and, yeah and, I, and I might mention, if it's okay, so – and I don't think we've touched on this, but you want to make sure that all of your horses can trailer load ahead of time. And you want to have a plan so that, you know, like most of us don't have a uh, big enough trailer for all of our horses, or most of us have more horses than we have trailer space. So you want to have a plan with other horse friends so that they will be available to come pick up your horses. Or if you can't take them all, what you're going to do with the ones that you leave behind and so that's usually requires identifying a fire safe area on your property. So that's a big area like an arena, a sand arena with metal like pipe fencing or panel fencing. So you'd put the horses that you can't evacuate, you'd put them into the into that area. If you have time, you can put water and feed in the center in metal containers. You also want to remove all synthetics so that fly sheets and fly masks and nylon halters because if sparks hit those things, it's worse than if it hit just their fur um, it, because the plastic will melt. I've heard of stories that uh, horses had to be euthanized just because of the burns that they had from wearing fly sheets and uh, the plastic melting on the horse. So 
identify where you would take your horses beforehand if you're going to trailer them out of there, and then also identify a failure, uh, fire safe area on your property where you would turn the ones out that you can't evacuate. Yeah. And I just a, a follow up on that and the evacuations. Uh, we heard stories from Santa Rosa where there were calls for we've got to evacuate horses on social media and we need horse trailers. And then I, if you've been down there, it's wine country with all those lovely country winding roads and they got blocked with horse trailers too many trailers going without a specific place to go so oh um, wow yeah so some something yeah, so, to keep in mind too and where you might want to take them what's where you might want to take them to would be to a, another horse friend's property that's well away from where the fires are um, and or a pre-identified if there's a fairgrounds that's willing to take them. That has to be worked out ahead of time. You can't just show up to the local horse park and say, hey, will you take my horse? Because they may have other events going on or they may not have the insurance for it. Uh, so you have to identify that kind of thing ahead of time. Yeah. And we had a question from Leslie in Colorado asking that. How how do you put together an evacuation plan for wildfire or barn fire? Do uh, either of you um, have some tips that, that we haven't covered yet this evening? Uh, I'll, I'll, take a, I'll take a first swag at that, and I'll just yeah. tell you that that really comes down to, um, even as civilians, asking your county emergency manager what is their plan. Since 2006, um, after Hurricane Katrina and all those things, there was something called the PETS Act, P-E-T-S Act. And if you look that up, it has to do with the evacuation of pets. Now, technically, horses are not included in that plan. However, we all know that for most of us that own horses, that is part of our family. And we know that people are going to show those things up. So ask your local emergency manager, what is their plan for evacuation and sheltering within your county? Um, you can talk to your local fire department, but really the emergency manager should have a plan. And if their plan is a little crappy piece of paper that's in some file drawer somewhere, then you got to get involved and say, hey, listen, guys, we understand that you're, you know, coming up with your plans for humans. But we need a really good plan in our county for animals. Where are we going to put these kind of things? There's a lot of expertise out there on the internet. If you can't find it, email me um, or get a hold of me somehow, PM me, whatever. I'm easy to find, and I will hook you up with the right people that have been doing a lot of disasters for animal planning. Um, and then, of course, it's your individual plan. You know, I tell people during the fire season, um, in Georgia, which doesn't happen very often in Georgia, but when it does, I've got an extra truck and it is fueled, it is hitched, it is loaded with everything I possibly could need so that I can load those horses up and go down the driveway. Um, when I, I don't want to be spending the five or 10 minutes it takes me to hitch it and then think about, oh, well, I got to stop and fuel and all these kind of things. I want to be able to load and go. And I learned that from the folks in Australia. That's what they do. Point it down the driveway, fuel it ready to go, everything loaded. You've already practiced, like Elaine said, teaching your horses to, to load under duress, in the dark, in the wind. My horse doesn't like slant loads. My horse doesn't like ramp loads. My horse doesn't like, no, your horse just doesn't load. Practice loading. Mm -hmm. And that is, mm -hmm. if all of us had our individual personal plans and preparation ready, then we wouldn't have some of these um, issues that happen. And then, of course, I call it the, the, uh, Candy Crush effect. You should be looking at the fire weather if you live in a place like that every single day. And you should know if it's going to happen to you. And if you're playing Candy Crush instead, then that's what's going to happen to you. So pay attention, situational awareness. It's all those things that come down to being aware of what's going on around you and being prepared as well. Yeah. And wow. I'm, I might add. To that, if I can, real quickly, yeah. that a lot of people say their fire preparedness plan is to hope that they don't have a wildfire, and that's that's uh, not a plan. Yeah. Well, and I 
you know, I have three horses and a two horse trailer and I have in my mind, which two horses go with me and it's heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. Um, but we had a lightning strike last summer. It was three miles from our house and it, it's really real. If, if you're, if you live in fire country and those are yeah. the really hard decisions that, that you have to be prepared to make and not have to make them in that moment. Cause it, it's really scary when you see smoke billowing not too far from your house. So. That's right. um, yes, exactly. Yeah. And there's so, there's um, so many apps and weather radios and those kinds of things these days. Um, it does amaze me here in Georgia, how few people have a weather radio in their house. And, and I, mine is right here all the time. And um, I really encourage you to invest in either get the apps on your phone or get a radio so that you know what's going on with the weather and you know what's going on with the fire same emergencies because they do tone things out to your phone, um, et cetera. And, and you can stay more abreast of what's going on. Yeah. And and I will add in my situation, I have a friend who is on call. She's on a different She's in a different part of town, but not so far that she couldn't get here. And so it, I picked up the phone and called her and she said, I'm hitched and I'm on my way and we were ready to go. <laughs> but it's still yeah. uh, you still risk leaving that that horse behind. And I would do the same for her. And that's our agreement. She's 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 near the pine trees and I'm near the juniper and both <laughs> both have fires. So, yeah, right. Um, yeah, good. We are we are out of time, but we do have TA is in our live audience, and TA has been asking about um, retrofitting old barns. Rebecca, we touched on this early in the program. Do you want to hit just some high points on recommendations you would make when people are yes, looking at their older barns? The biggest thing would be if I had uh, an older barn, that electrical needs to be updated, absolutely. And then, of course, I would bring in, it's free, bring in your local fire department. Have them walk around your barn. They can make some recommendations for you. Sometimes you're lucky and you may even have the electrical folks in your local fire department. But they will look at things like that reflective sign that needs to be for your address out by the road. We can't see your barn, believe it or not, even when it's burning in the dark, if it's behind a copse of trees. You've got to have that reflective sign at the road so we can find it in the middle of the dark. Um, and they're going to make those kinds of recommendations. Hey, you need to trim these trees back. We can't get our fire truck in here. And you'll say, well, I got a four horse trailer I bring in there. And they'll say, well, I don't care. I can't get my fire truck in here. Or we, you need to put the gravel in here because we're not, again, not going to bring our fire truck down your driveway if it's just clay and, and muddy. Um, because we'll sink our fire truck. It doesn't do any good. So you need to get some gravel in here. They'll make those kind of recommendations that maybe you've never even thought about to be able to even get access to your facility to be able to respond. And that's true for both wildfires and um, barn fires. And those older barns, it's not that they're unsafe. It's that most of the time nobody's looked in a long time at the electrical, the structural safety, um, those kind of things. And th the way we did things 50 years ago may be very different from how we do it today. Yeah. So uh, for everyone listening, we do have a list of resources that our editors picks from the horse.com uh, that you can read. There's 10 of them. Uh, it's at the horse.com slash fire prevention. If you want to take a look at that, our producer Jennifer has been very busy sharing links uh, for anyone who's listening online who'd like to click through and read some articles. Elaine mentioned the, uh, the fire wise plants and defensible spaces are all included in there. I, I want to go ahead and thank both of you. Uh, this has been a really great conversation. I wish we had more time because we have a lot more questions. I think, uh, Rebecca, for sure, we need to do something on uh, emergency preparedness other than fires and, and working with first responders because we have a lot of questions we didn't get to on that, um, as well as some uh, facility design things that Elaine, if, if you'll come back and join us sometime, we can talk about those. But unfortunately, yeah, unfortunately, that's all the time we have. But but thank you, Elaine and Rebecca, for, for joining us. Well, thank you for your attention to this important topic, and thank you for having me. Yeah. Absolutely. Fantastic. I'm just glad to have so many people involved. 
I want to thank everyone who joined us tonight and listened live, everyone who will, who's going to listen in the future on our uh, recorded podcast. And for everyone who submitted their questions, uh, we can't do these events without your questions and inquisitive minds. So I hope that you will join us next month for horse the or Ask the Horse Live. We're going to be talking about Lyme disease. We expect that to be a very popular uh, and uh, hot topic. Uh, until then, from all of us here at the horse, we hope you have a great night.